in. So, welcome to Friday. Today we're going to talk about databases. Uh, the first thing I'll be showing is this really fun thing that I like to use called LevelDB. So, LevelDB is a library that was built by Google for the Chrome web browser. It was actually built to support this thing called IndexedDB that is a standard in browsers, but it's really garbage and nobody likes it, and probably the best way to use IndexedDB is actually to wrap it so that it looks like LevelDB, because LevelDB is much nicer to work with. Um, my friend Max has a project that does that. It's really, it's pretty good. Anyways, so LevelDB. I'll be talking about the Node ecosystem for LevelDB because it's one of the biggest and it's got a huge number of packages. And I really like it because it's very minimal and you can get a lot done with it. So, uh, I think first it's, it's good to sort of discuss what is going on with databases a little bit. So, there's two main kinds of databases. There are embedded databases and then there are standalone databases. So, um, an embedded database would be like LevelDB, uh, but also SQLite or BerkeleyDB, if any of you have ever heard of that. Uh, these are databases that live inside of a process. So it's basically just a library that you that you require, that you include. And once you include that library, the library handles uh, modifying files on disk and that sort of thing. So uh, embedded databases are, are like they're they're around, but people don't as much use them directly. Although I think it's a pretty good approach. Um, you're probably familiar with these kinds of databases, or you've at least heard of them. These are standalone databases. These are services that you run on your machine, like Postgres or MySQL, or maybe MongoDB, CouchDB. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's SQL or not. It's sort of its own service that you spin up separately from your application. Whereas if you go with an embedded database, whether that's SQL or not, you include it as a library. So uh, the other kind of distinction here is that a lot of databases use this language, this query language called SQL, um, and that will be the second talk today. But LevelDB does not use that. It, it has its own uh, API-driven way of querying the database and it's sort of thing. So my favorite part about LevelDB is because it's just a library, you can install it with a package manager. So all that you have to do is do npm install level, and then you just require it like it's any other library. So it's, because it's built against Google's <coughs> LevelDB C++ library, um, it needs to be compiled, so you'll have to have a compiler on your system configured correctly, but if you've already set up your system, then you should have all of that stuff. And we can just do uh, varDB and equals level, and then you pass in a path, and then if this path doesn't exist, it will automatically be created. So if we do npm install level, I've already done that because it takes a little while. So we can just make db.js. So I'll do var level equals require level. Now var db equals level whatever.db. And so this program, um, like it doesn't really do much, but it does do one thing. So it created this directory that wasn't there before called whatever.db. If, if I look in that directory, whatever.db, it's actually got a bunch of garbage in it. Um, these are internal files that LevelDB is using to store the data. You don't really have to care about that. Just know that LevelDB will create a directory if it doesn't already exist. Like here it already exists, so it doesn't do anything. Uh, and that's it. So what can LevelDB do? Well, here are some things. So LevelDB is a key value store. So it's kind of like an object or dictionary in, in programming language. Um, you can get keys, you can put a new value into the database uh, with a key and value, you can delete items, you can uh, create an atomic batch of items, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And you can query the database with this thing called create read stream. So all of that stuff that we were discussing about streams in Node apply here with this method. Um, but importantly, that's pretty much it. 
So these are what you have to work with. And these few primitives that are very carefully chosen are really enough to build pretty much whatever kind of abstraction you would need building an application. Um, that includes building an entire like relational system. You could build that. I wouldn't do that because level D really like if you want that, just go with Postgres or something. But if you do want these other features that level DB offers, like you can just npm install it and it can be embedded in your application. Or maybe you have a SQL database, but you it's really not suited for just this kind of one-off little thing you need to sneak in. So level DB is, is a good fit for that. Um, I use it all over the place myself, but okay. So now let's actually do something with our database. So the, one of the first things we can do is do dot put. Put takes a key and a value. If you don't pass any encodings, those that value uh, should be a string. So if you want to store like an object, for example, you would have to do JSON dot stringify. So, uh, but let's just do something very simple to get started. So can do db.put um, wizard and value cats. And that takes an optional callback that will give you an error if there was an error inserting into the database, which there isn't usually, but if there is, we should want to know about it. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we'll print. Okay. Cool. So this is our program now. If I run db.js, it's okay. So now we've got a key called wizard, and the value should be cats. So now that this is in our database, I'll just comment this part out to, to remind ourselves that we inserted that. Uh, and we can do this other thing called get. With db.get, you take a key as the, as the first argument. So in our case, that would be wizard. And you, get, you pass in a callback where you get the error as the first parameter, which is a standard node convention, and you get the value as the second argument. So if I do db.get wizard, and I pass in a callback, error value, then if error, I should want to know about that, so I'll just print out an error message. Otherwise, I'll print out value equals and the value. So if I do this, then I should, even though I'm not inserting that into the database, that, that data already exists in our database. So I should be able to see what we print last time, which was cats. Great. So uh, this is, yeah, questions? So why does console about all of our rather than standard output? Why does console, you can just do that. Oh. That's the answer. <laughs> you can just do that. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> and you can also do console.error and that prints to standard error. These are just nice little things. Uh, you can print things with streams too, but if you just need to one off print something, console.log is great. Okay, so we've put something in our database, we've gotten it back out again. Uh, if we didn't do that, so if I just straight up delete that database and I run uh, this code again, then we get an error, key not found. So that key wizard wasn't found in our database because I deleted it, so if I put that back, then it will work again. But um, one thing that we can do now is, so we're putting strings in our database, and strings aren't too useful in themselves, so what we can do is we can pass in this option to the level DB. Uh, when we create our level DB, the second argument you can give is an option, and one of the very common things to do is set a value encoding to JSON. This will automatically encode strings to and from JSON for us. So if I want to have an object, maybe a cat's object instead. So cats uh, say meow um, want cat food. Okay, so we can put an object in our database. So if I run this, it will insert that record. So we get our message okay. Hang on. There we go. Okay. So we get our message okay. Now uh, we can comment this out again, and this time we should get an object instead of. There we go. So we get an object instead of a string. That's right. 
very handy. Otherwise, you would have to do, uh, when you put something into the database, you would have to do um, the stringification yourself, which would get a little verbose. You would have to do json.stringify that, and then you would have to do json.parse again, which would be annoying if you don't do value encoding. So that's value encoding. Um, So uh, that's put, that's get, very simple. So another thing we can do is delete things. That's just, you know, standard stuff. So if we want to delete our wizard key, we just, instead of get, we do del, and that will give us an error if something weird happens. Otherwise, we can console log, delete it okay. So if I run this program, now we've deleted our, our wizard key. Standard stuff. Okay. Okay, so this is a very simplistic view of the database. It's not very practical for too many purposes. It's fine if you just have simple keys and simple values, but a lot of the time in databases, what you'll need to do is insert several keys at once, atomically. So what it's this is this idea from databases called atomicity, which is like from the word atom and then they throw icity on the end of it for some reason. Um, but atomicity means that either all of the transactions succeed, so you insert all of the keys and they all live in the database, or none of that happened. So you, you'll never get into an intermediate state where maybe like two of the keys got written, but then three more didn't. Um, if your database supports atomicity, then you can insert batches of things all at once. And so this is important because there's this other idea in databases Consistency, and that's where. Uh, so, oh, I didn't finish writing this up. But <laughs> so, um, for an example, suppose you have, uh, suppose you have like a user signup page. Now, if you need to store one key for maybe like the username and their bio, right? They're just their message. Um, but then you need to store another key that has like their password. Their, ideally, there's hashed and salted password if you're going to store passwords. So that's two keys that we need to insert. But imagine that we insert the first key with db.put, and then uh, then we're going to insert the second key, but maybe our server crashed for some reason because we, like, we tried to index a key and it was undefined or something like that. Or maybe the power just goes out, right? So in that case, if we don't have atomicity, then our database is going to be inconsistent because we'll have a user who has, who's in our database but can't lo ever log in because they don't have a username and password record. So that's really bad. Um, luckily, LevelDB supports this feature called db.batch that lets us insert multiple things at once. Um, you can also pass in an optional callback in here as the second argument, but you give it an array of items. Actually, that's, that's wrong. You have to put type put for this because you can delete and put things at the, at the same time. Um, so let's just play around with that. So I'll keep the value encoding to JSON. Now we'll do db.batch. This takes an array so and a callback. So I'll just define a callback right here. Maybe I'll call it done. I like done. That's a good thing. So we have our callback. Um, this gets an error just like all the other messages. So um, if error console dot error error else console dot log okay great so now in our db dot batch uh, we've got to put the type which can be put or delete and then we've got to put a key like maybe a b c and a value one two three uh, and we can put another key at the same time so x y z value four five six we can put as many keys as we need. Um, so if I save that and I run the program, now we've got two keys in our database. And we'll never get just the first key or just the second key. It'll be consistent, which is very good. So um, the next thing we can start to do with our database here is the last uh, method, which
which is create read stream. So with create read stream, you can specify ranges into the database. This is LogoDB's main feature. Um, because of how, because of the internal data structure, uh, it's kind of this tree structure that you can very efficiently pull out ranges. So you can query, uh, so if you structure your keys, you can always pull out very efficiently um, all of the keys between some ranges. So if the keys are strings, um, what we can do, let's see, okay, so let's put in some more items in our database so we can play around with this idea. So for DF, GHI, um, maybe Q, and these will be different values, but it's not too important. So we do a, a batch with this information, then after the batch, uh, after the batch is complete, what we can do is do db.create read stream uh, and give it some options. So greater than and less than, and uh, a simple way to pronounce stuff from streams is that I didn't talk about is you can just register an data listener. That's good for debugging like this, but it's not too great for some other stuff. Anyways, so if I want to query our database now, after all of those records get inserted, I can pick out, maybe I just want to pick out everything uh, greater than D, but less than Q. So this should print out uh, DEF, GHI, but it shouldn't print Q because Q is actually equal to Q, not less than. So we should get two records if that works. If I run it, great, we get two records. Uh, DEF, GHI, yeah, question. So 
Byte-wise, we'll just make numbers work like you think they should work. Um, it also has some nice other properties, like um, it will actually sort uh, numbers before strings, and then it will sort arrays after that, which isn't too important, but one nice property of ByteWise is that if you use the value null in JavaScript, it will always come first, and the value undefined will always come last. So we can, and uh, arrays will be sorted component-wise. So if you have an array, each item in the array will be sorted individually based on its type. So I, I'll show, that's, maybe that's not, doesn't seem too applicable right now, but I'll, I can show you how that, how that plays out. So, because we can sort arrays, we can actually have keys that are arrays. And so if you want to have, like, a user separate from posts, separate from other kinds of information in your database, you can include a prefix, like the first element would be user, if it's a user key, maybe the second is the username. Um, what's really nice about that is you can use create read stream to pull out every user by just passing in null and undefined. So if we do this, so to, to install ByteWise, what you've got to do is, just like we have value encoding here, you can pass in a key encoding. So if you just do key encoding required ByteWise, you can use ByteWise. Um, so this data is already in our database, uh, so we don't really need to do that again. But, oh, hang on. But we should put some new data. So let me just do some new data here. Uh, I've actually got some data prepared. So, so I've got this uh, bytewise.json file. This is uh, just some JSON with a key, and these are arrays, like the first element maybe hacker space, or hacker, or item, I think, or tool or something. Whee. Right, so the key, the first element would be tool, or hacker, or hacker space. So pseudorum would be like the second element. So if I take this information, one really handy thing, if you have some canned information like that, we can just do db.batch, and because in Node you can require JSON files, you can just do require bytewise.json and we can give it a callback. So now, inside of this callback, we'll be ready to go. So I will just print out, I don't know, we could, we could run that, but we might as well run a query. So if we want to list all of the hacker spaces, for instance, we could do db.create readstream. Um, greater than hackerspace null, because null is the first thing to sort, and less than hackerspace undefined. Um, and then I'll just print the data out like this. So if I run this program, uh, I should get a list of all of the hackerspaces, and I do, cool. So um, you'll notice that we also get back the key in addition to the value, and this is just like what you get back from um, and, oh, hang on, I'm actually getting some stuff I didn't expect. So, greater than and less than. I think my data might be a little bit messed up. Let's see. Key, uh, key, key. What? I think something is probably backwards. Maybe it's greater than. It looks like as if I just passed in no information. Yeah. Well, let's list all of the tools, maybe. And I'll do what I find. I think it should be key is hacker space. Yeah, well, I was just trying something else. That's what I tried the first time, but I'm getting a weird result back. I think, why don't, there might be some garbage data in the database. Oh, I think I know what it might have been. I was inserting, so I switched the encoding kind of without clearing the database, so that might have. What? Greater than, less than, key encoding, value encoding. Okay, well, I don't know why this demo is not working, but this would. This would normally work. Um, this 
is like kind of how you normally partition your data um, with level. So another common way to do this is to use a delimiter, like inline. So this is sometimes useful if you just have to slap some things together pretty quick. Uh, it's kind of a common convention. You can use whatever delimiter you like, but it's kind of common to use an exclamation mark because the exclamation mark is ASCII value 21, which is very low. So you won't accidentally get um, a lot of mixing of like data mostly. And then it's also a common convention if you do use ASCII characters to use a tilde, which is ASCII character, I believe, uh, 127. So that's very high. It's, it's uh, after a lot of all of the ASCII characters that are printable. So you can also do, do data this way. Um, I suppose I could show you an example of that. So this data.json file should be the same data. Hopefully this will work. That um, does not is not formatted with key encoding. It's just using delimiters. So if I get rid of the database and I do this now, I should be able to do hackerspace uh, and then hackerspace and then tilde and then tilde is very high in ASCII. So all of the all of the hackerspace names, Noisebridge, Pseudorum, those are all below the tilde. Um, so if I run this program again, whoops. Is that an extra uh, exclamation point instead of? Did I? It looks good. Hackerspace exclamation point, hackerspace point. Yeah. Yeah, so you want this exclamation point here because all of the data in data.json is formatted. Here, I'll, I, can, I can show you how it's formatted. So. Everything is formatted with an exclamation mark after it. So if you ever want to extend that data with more indexes, you can just like hackerspace dash boo or whatever. That would be separate. So you keep things separate this way. Um, but I think I must have. Oh, I don't have a type in this. Oh goodness. Okay. So let me fix my data. I think that might have been what it was before as well. So let me just fix my own data very quickly here. Um, so x dot type equals put return x. Energy data. Okay. Whatever that be. And then no dot.js. Oh, and now it works. Okay. So I think that might have been the problem before as yeah. well. Uh, so why don't I fix the bitewise one as well? Then if this was the problem. Because it's basically the same thing. Okay. Yeah. If you use batch. Do not forget to put the type because everything will break um, in weird ways. So I should submit a pull request uh, to the project <laughs> that fixes that bug. That just gave you a response without warning. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, let me just delete the database from before. Okay, well, that one's still messed up. I don't know why, but the, the other example works. here. So you, you know, it's kind of common to have arrays, so you can have user, like substack, maybe I have a bio, beep boop. You could also have uh, posts. Um, so if I want to post some information, I can store that under my username and the key. And this is really good because now I can query all of the posts by substack or by max just by doing a query that looks like, uh, like this. So user, substack, null, User substack undefined. This will give us all of the information that's like all of my posts, basically. Oh, sorry, that should be posts in the first part. Um, yeah, I can close the door, thanks. Okay, so, and another nice thing to note uh, if you do store posts, it's really good to go with this thing called ISO 8601. Um, so, normally when you do a new date, that two string, it's this garbage. It's like but if you want to include dates in a database, what you really want to happen is for these dates to be sorted lexicographically. You want dates that are, like, you want them to come in chronological order if you sort them. If you do this, you're not going to get that because, uh, see if I make up a number, I'll get another day. So, like, when all of the Wednesdays will come 
after all of Fridays, which is like, when would you ever need that? Probably never, but maybe there's a use case for that. A uh, better thing to do is do uh, two ISO date, which I think I had before. Uh, whoa, hang on. New date. Uh, sorry, two ISO string. ISO string, like that. Now you get this formatted date. And what's really nice is the year is the first thing that's numeric. Uh, then you get zero padded, which is also very good, month and you get um, the date and the time. So these whole lexicographically sort. They're really nice to deal with. Um, another thing, if you're using ByteWise, you can do this thing, uh, date.now, and that'll give you numbers. That's sometimes useful as well. Um, but you have to be careful, because if you turn that into a string, then you run into all of the problems with like dates. If they're recent dates, it won't be a problem because 1.4 has not changed in a very long time. Uh, but if it's something further in the past or further in the future, you'll, it'll blow up in weird ways. So it's better probably just to do ISO strings or if you're using ByteWise um, and not to do it by hand. So, um, okay. So we've seen uh, posts for a particular user. Um, I guess I can pack up something really fast for that, so I'll just get rid of all this garbage. Um, right. So why don't I do this without ByteWise, but it should be very trivial to translate. So if I have a batch, uh, type put key uh, user substack value, we don't need a value really, so, and then I'll make another user um, in K30, whoops, user in K30. Now maybe we have some posts, right? So I could say beep, boop. And actually that key should include the date. So if I make it the date, whatever. I mean, really you want more precision and you want something that has a random, uh, like you also probably want an ID in that because otherwise if I make two posts at approximately the same time, one of those posts will be overwritten. So you usually want to add some entropy or some, some kind of indexing to this scheme. Yeah, there's a question back there. It's a delimiter, so it's really common to use delimiters um, because this way you can sort of partition your key structure. So if I want to pull out, okay, so the problem would be, um, Okay, so if I just did... Is the whole thing one whole long key or... Yes, so the entire database is one gigantic key. This is why it's useful to do partitions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of using this so that I can structure queries where I'm only going to pick up uh, related pieces of information that I want to fetch from the database. So if I do user, uh, then I can pull out a list of all of the users very easily by doing less than user exclamation mark greater than user exclamation mark tilde, for example. Um, and likewise for posts. So if I want to do like a post by a user, I can do this. Uh, so I'll make two posts for me. That'll be good. So, and maybe one on that date. Okay, so if this is our batch, what I can do is, um, so, if that's our information, then the question arises, how do we get uh, all of the posts? So if there's posts by multiple users, they're not going to be sorted in lexicographic order if we do something like this, right? Okay. So if we want to do a query now to get all of the posts, we would have to like post process to sort them, which is not very great. So right, do db.create read stream, uh, less than or greater than post. This will give us all of the posts, but they won't be in order necessarily. Um, so if I just run that, okay. So there's all of the posts, but they're not sorted. They're sorted by username, which uh, is not great. So what's common is because we're doing batch. Um, 
when, whenever we insert one of these posts, we're not probably in an application going to insert everything in advance like this, but uh, when you do sort of insert an individual post, it's common to insert uh, multiple things like this. So if I just remove the username right from that, and I call it something else like post uh, all, post all, hang on, if I copy that, So now if we kind of interleave each post with a post all that doesn't have the username, we can query by post all to get all of the posts. There we go. All of the posts uh, sorted by date. Uh, January 2nd, January 3rd, January 4th. Cool. So if you want to build a feed that's kind of like global or for some subset of users, you can structure your data like that. Um, this is called a secondary index, yeah. So would you, if I was, you know, building a user and post-based system, would I want to do both, like two entries for each post person? Um, yeah, so one thing that I didn't put in here is that you probably wouldn't uh, include the data twice, you would mm -hmm. just include the data once. So in our post all, for example, uh, I could just put a zero, that'll save space and redundancy as well in case we want to modify the original post. So we don't need to store the data twice because we can reconstruct what the data is because we have, um, uh, or if I put the username in here actually, we would need. Yeah. So actually a better way to do it in this case would be to like, to make this, the post keys with the username to be the secondary keys and the post names without that to be the primary keys. So if I restructure things like post user instead of post all, and if the post users point at uh, the post alls, which they do because the key is already in the in here, then we can construct a key. So let me just do that really quick, and then I'll, I'll do a question. Okay, so we don't need a value, so you can just put zero if you like. Wizard school. Um, now we can just call that post. Okay, so post, and then post user points at the post. We have a post, and post user points at the post. Doesn't need a value anymore. Um, and there we go, and we have the original post. Okay, so, so I think this data, this data looks good. Oh, we have a post user here as well. Don't need to get rid of that. Okay, so, which is we going to do? Great, okay. So now, if we want to query our database, uh, what we can do, post all, or just, this will give us a list of the posts, but now maybe we want to get the posts by a particular user. So if I do substack, substack, what I'll get is, uh, okay, so I get all of the posts by me, but there's no values, so how do we get at the original values? Well, we can construct that from this part of the key, right? Because it's just post exclamation mark the rest of the key. So to do that, um, I'll just put a, a real function in here, or I could pipe to through, for example, why don't I just pipe to through? And I'll have a function right. So require through, and I believe I need to install it, so I'll do that really fast. <laughs> okay, so if I pipe to through, Now what I can do is do db.get for each post in turn. So the row.key is going to be uh, post user substacks. So we don't care about the first part. So if I split on exclamation mark, parts equals split. And then if I slice off the first two by doing slice two, and I rejoin with exclamation mark, then I can put post in front. So that's a lot of talking, but if you do this, <laughs> this will be post exclamation mark and then the rest of the key, like I was showing with, uh, with the text editor. So now, um, we can just get that key, their value. Um, better do that, in case we get an error. And then I'll print the value of the post. So, right, error. Uh, invalid non-string, oh right. Uh, this is because these are objects. 
stream of objects, so you need to use uh, object mode. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wizards, cool. Uh, the reason why I didn't print the rest is I forgot to call next. So, if I early return, great. So now we have users and posts. We just made it. Great. Wizards, wizards, school. All of the messages by me. If I want to get another user, I can uh, include a different name. You can pass this in as a variable if you like. Uh, it's used byte-wise. It's just a matter of instead of using exclamation marks, um, you just get a race. So it's a little bit nicer to deal with byte-wise. Um, there's the other post by the other user. Great. So um, that's an example of a secondary index, your primary and secondary. So yeah, question. Just a clarifying question. Um, if you um, go back to the data set that you were um, modifying to change the. Uh, yeah. Uh, which part? Value zero for our secondary indexes. Yeah, got it. Yeah. So we're only storing the, the data at once. Right, perfect. Thank yeah. You. And then we're, uh, it's, it's sometimes called in other contexts, it's called a foreign key. When you, in this case, it's sort of an implicit foreign key because it's part of our key structure, but we can use this information to point back at the original. So, yeah. And then so they would have the, the two, the primary and secondary would have the same random entropy that was passed to the other. Yeah. And, and uh, for the in, in terms of that, this ID, this like random entropy, a good thing to do is to uh, use the hash of the content itself. This is called a content addressable data. One reason why that's really nice is if you insert the same data twice, uh, you'll only need to store it once. Um, it also has some other nice properties, like you don't have to think very much about generating keys and your key generation structure or whatever. Yep. Uh, you can use the core crypto library. So if you do node require crypto, um, there's a there's some functions in here like that create hash. Mm -hmm. So if I do like SHA-256, I think that works, yeah. Um, makes a hash object. It's a little bit messy to do it because it's kind of, so you do like h dot write your data or you can pipe a stream to it. Um, a little bit simpler way is to use this module called SHA-SUM. And what Shasm does is it lets you provide a string or a buffer. Um, so if I require Shasm ABC, I get back this value. Um, but if I provide an object, it'll actually uh, JSON.stringify that to hash the representation. And it does a little trick that's kind of subtle. It actually uses a stable sorting algorithm on the stringification so that when you do json.stringify, it's deterministic. Um, this is a problem because if you have, so problem is this is valid JSON, right? That's valid JSON, but so is this. And aren't those the same object? Because for objects, sor the sorting is not defined. So the Shasm object will automatically sort the keys before it, recursively before it. So you don't have to think as much about that kind of stuff. Does that so you help? get a different hash. For uh, you get the same hash. The same so let me show you that. So if I do x5, y4, I get that hash. If I do y4, I get the same hash. Yeah. But if I do stringify on those, I don't get the same hash. At least not the last time I checked. And this is just a quirk of sorting. Yeah, I get different hashes. So if I try to hash that natively, it'll go all weird. So if you shot some, it's, it's good. Yeah, more questions? Or, yes, Scott.
So it's a string or a buffer if you don't set a value encoding, but if you do set a value encoding like JSON, then it's just going to be um, stuff that JSON can support. So JSON supports like strings, numbers, um, you know, true, false, objects, arrays, not too much else though. Um, so if you do have stuff like images, for example, what I would recommend is just uh, save the hash of that content and you can do that with the module. Uh, so there's a really cool module called uh, create, or sorry, it's um, content addressable blob store. And content addressable blob store is a great, uh, it's like a great counterpart to LevelDB because it can handle storing your blob data, your images, your music files, your like big long posts, and LevelDB can provide the metadata. Um, this is a really common pattern in other databases too. You sort of like, because databases aren't very good at storing really big files typically, but they're great at lots of little metadata stuff. So what we could do, I'll just I'll just show you how, uh, how content addressable blob store works really quick because um, cause it, it should be pretty obvious how you can pair this up with LevelDB. Um, so first thing you do is you require content addressable blob store, quite a mouthful. Um, actually, I, I like this convention better. So you require that module, then you make an instance of it, and you can give it a directory by doing, I think, dir and then like, like dot slash blobs or dir name plus blobs, whatever. Um, once we've done that, uh, you do create write stream, just like fs and you write data, so w.write, beep boop, new line, and we can end it as well. Okay, so what this will do is create, um, this will put, it'll first of all hash everything that we write to it, and then second of all, content addressable blob store will write out that information to a file on disk, and it will It'll give us a key, I think. Let me just print out the arguments because I don't remember offhand what they are. So if I run this program, I get, okay, I get an empty object, which is a bit weird. Um, I think w.key, though, will tell me what key it is. Okay, cool. So now I have a hash, right? If I look in blobs, uh, it's actually putting it somewhere that's kind of like the hash. If I cut that out, I can print see with the message, so it actually stored it there. Uh, that's a little bit not nice to do with FS, but what you can do instead. So once, once you have a hash, so if I comment out this stuff, because we've already populated our blob store, what I can do is store dot uh, create read stream, and then the key is like that hash, I'll take it from processor <coughs> D. Then I can pipe that to the standard app, how about? So this is like a little reader function, right? And then store.js, and if I paste that hash, I get out the message that I put in. Great. So pairing up a blob store with level to be is like, I've done that a number of times, it works really well, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, all that you store in level to be is that hash, not the actual content. If it's big content, it's a little content, it's fine to put that in level to be, but. Um, yeah, you question. can use this like with images, if they're in your directory, and like send in, like, how would you, if you had an image file, how would you choose yeah. those? If I had an image file, uh, so for example, maybe I, okay, so yeah. if I go back to the right code, right, right here I'm just ending the code, but um, okay, so let's actually put an image in, that's a great way to do it. So we require fs, now I can do fs.create read stream, and I'll take the image name from process argv2, and I'll pipe that into the blob store. So then I can listen on the finish event. And then I know that uh, the data has been written and I can uh, print out what the hash was, which is w.key. Okay, so this is how we do it. Uh, hang on, I forgot which of like garbage jobs. Accidentally, there we go. Hang on, okay, there we go. Never mind that. So uh, now I can run the program. So if I do, uh, let's media vector, 
pedestal wire, which is uh, show and tell. Um, that's that vector image. If I do that, I get a hash. And then if I put back the code that reads out data, then I should be able to read the image. So there we go, which is SVG, so we can actually look at it. That's how we can store images. What's really nice is because this is a stream, um, we could just make that a web server if we want. So <laughs> let's just do that. <laughs> so require HTTP, and uh, instead of process arc v, we'll just use the URL. So create server function rec res. This is the great thing about streams is because like standard out is a stream, but so is res, right? So just type the res. Okay. Um, and we'll get the key from uh, rec.url uh, and we'll slice off the first character, which is always a forward slash. So one little caveat though is you'll need to listen for errors. So r dot on error. I'll just like res dot end error plus new line. Whatever. Who cares? Okay. Then r dot type res. So this should be a server and we'll listen on a port. Not five thousand. So that's not a store anymore, it's actually a HTTP server. So now if we curl for localhost 5000, so hash, we get wow. vector image. Yay! Wow. Why don't we just put a database in that? Why not? <laughs> okay, so just require level and just make a database. Um, and we will instantiate it with like DB. That's where we'll put our data, and we'll use a value encoding of JSON, because that's pretty handy. That's what I usually use. Um, yeah. So if we get a post, if rec.method is a post, then we'll store.create write stream to uh, put this data into our database. So because request is just a readable stream, we can pipe that into our write stream, right? That's, we can do that, of course. And then we can listen for the finish event. And now when the finish event fires, w.key should be set. So what I can do is, uh, so when we get w.key, we can put that in the database with db.put. We need to put multiple things, we can use db.batch, but in this case, just something simple will work. So I wanna put uh, images, exclamation mark, and then put key maybe. That'll be kind of nice. Uh, that'll be good for a primary key. Actually, let's do the whole nine yards here. Let's do a batch <laughs> to put images. So, so this will be type put. Remember that always. Uh, key images plus key, that's our primary key. Mm -hmm. And the value, we don't actually need a value because the key is enough information to actually fetch the data from the database. Okay. So, what's next? The second key that we'll need is maybe the date. So we have uh, images recent. Then we can take the now plus exclamation mark plus key. And that's a bit long, so I'll take this and I'll stick it in a variable. Um, now key. Fair now key equals. And then we need to create a now, which uh, new dates to ISO string is pretty sweet. I was talking about earlier. Okay. Um, yeah, looks good. Okay, so uh, this will let us put data into our database. The last thing is just um, if there's an error, we need to complain about it. So if error, uh, res.end error. So you could do error codes and stuff, static rec dot a res dot status code if you want, but whatever, this is fine. Uh, else we'll just end with, um, it's pretty good to print the key when you, when you submit an image. Okay. So now, uh, this will let us save images. So next, what we need to do is be able to fetch them. So, this is where the rest of this code comes in. So we just stuff that in our else handler. And what we can do is, um, nothing, that should work. So, okay, but we're not actually using the database for anything yet, right? If we know the hash, that's fine. But what if we want to
might just get a list of all of the images. That's something that our database would be good at, right? So if we want to get a list of all of the recent images, uh, maybe our rec.url is going to be um, images. And I'll just print out a hash. We can do db.create root stream. Um, dot pipe. Or no, not do dot pipe yet. Um, greater than images, less than images, tilde. That's all of the images. Uh, there's some other things I didn't mention. You can also do limit. If you want to limit the number of entries, like to 100 or something, um, you can also. So that's sometimes handy if you want to, like, uh, it's called paginate results. That's like have a page of stuff, like 50 items, and then you click next, you go to the next 50. But you've got to set all of that up yourself with less than, greater than stuff. Um, but for now, whatever, we'll just print out all of the images. Uh, that's going to be our read stream, and then we can pipe to through dot obj, get our row, and I forgot to require through, so why don't I do that, or through, two. Okay, so uh, now we can just res dot write things, or um, actually pipe that through to our response. Now if I put, if I push items from my stream to the results, so this dot push, uh, row dot, um, let's see. So the keys are going to be, uh, they're not actually images, they're images recent. Wow. So the second part, there's going to be three parts in these, in these keys, right? Images recent is the first part, the date is going to be the second part, and the hash is going to be the third part. So we'll sort of implicitly uh, print out the results from like most recent to, to oldest. And then uh, the third part, index 2, is what we actually care about, which is the hash. So if I split the key on exclamation mark, and I do index 2, and I add in a new line, then we should get all of the images in our database sorted by date. Um, okay, if we do all of that, then it should work. I can get rid of this garbage. So who knows if that'll work? I don't. Um, I'm still running the old server, so I better kill that as well. So if I do store.js, all right, so I can background that. Um, so if I do localhost 5,000 images, hopefully it won't explode on me. Okay, good so far. We haven't put any images into our database yet, and it hasn't given us any errors. Okay, so to upload an image, uh, I'll send a post, and for input, I'll put in, uh, let's see, that Patasaur, Patasaur wireframe. Cool, and we get back our hash. So now, from this hash, what we should be able to do is go to localhost 5000, slash our hash. Um, let me just see what's up here. Localhost 5000. I probably forgot to type something. Okay, so that's weird. We don't actually get any response back. Uh, get an OK message. So I think, let me just debug this really fast. So, so our else handler should be kicking in for that. Um, should be create read stream. Let's just double check that our blob store has that data. So it starts with uh, E3 and it's a PO. Oh, I know what the problem is. When we created our write stream, we didn't actually um, put data into it. So what we need to do is, okay, we create a write stream, we pipe, we pipe the request into it, and we print the result, so that's kind of weird. Oh, I know what it is. I did curl wrong. So, uh, this part was actually wrong. What I should have done is, uh, you have to do dash t dash to get input from standard in. So now, we can query the list of images. There should be two, a blank image and, uh, oh, yeah. Control that. We get two images. If I go to localhost slash 5000 slash that image, yeah, wow. I get an image. Wow. Cool. <laughs> so if I go to localhost 5000 slash images, I should get the list as well that I should get in the So you can upload images. Uh, they'll be stored in level DB. They're sorted by date. You can sort on other things if you want. You just add other secondary indexes. You can sort by user. You can make users. You can make posts. 
etc. Okay, so that's secondary indexes. <laughs> um, you can query them. We kind of covered all this stuff. So some other nice things we can do with level to be. Uh, there's this thing called sublevel down. You might have noticed that it's sort of a little bit awkward. Some, I mean, sometimes it's fine, but uh, to always have to put like user exclamation mark and whatever. So there's this module sublevel down that kind of handles that more nicely. What you do is you can create sublevel. You pass in a DB reference and you can pass in a prefix, and then it'll kind of automatically stuff in the exclamation marks and whatever, so you don't have to look at them. So if I put uh, cat's db dot put message and robo db dot put message, these keys won't overwrite each other because they'll be prefixed by uh, cats and robots. So sublevel down is really nice for stuff. Um, it's also really nice for this other purpose, which is modularity. So if you have a sublevel down, you can create a new kind of uh, nested level DB instance, and it'll be sort of automatically prefixed for you. So when you automatically prefix something, you can hand that off to a module that will it, that doesn't have to worry that it might accidentally step on your toes when you have your database stuff going on. So there's these are these are just a few modules that I could think of off the top of my head, but they're actually if not. Well, there's certainly hundreds of modules in NPM that take a level DB instance as an argument, but there are possibly thousands. Um, so here's a few. Um, I mentioned that user accounts are actually, so I kind of touched on that, but they're actually really hard to do correctly because if you want to store passwords, what you should be doing is hashing those passwords so you don't actually have the plain text of that password on your database so that if your database gets compromised, don't accidentally disclose all of your users' passwords. And to do that properly, what you should be doing is storing a salt, which is a random value, uh, inside of that hashing function. So you take the hash of a salt plus the password. The salt would be stored alongside the username. Anyway, if you don't want to care about all of that, there's other things you have to care about when you make a user account. And if you want to use LevelDB, you can use this module that I wrote called the Countdown. And it does all of that stuff I just was complaining about that I knew way too much about now. So you don't have to think about this stuff anymore. Um, what's nice is you just pass it, read me a countdown. You just pass it a level DB. So here's how to use a countdown. You create a level DB like normal, and then you just pass it in. And if you wanted to, you could pass in a sublevel. And then the sublevel stuff would just happen in its own little nested sandbox, and you could just get along using level DB like you normally would. And so like this one creates a user account, do users.create, and there's also users.verify, the login stuff. Uh, I have an example that's not quite finished yet, but uh, it's example level B website um, with a countdown in the, in the notes here. And also, the level, the level DB docs are at this address, which is also in the lecture notes. Uh, so, for homework, op completely optional homework that no one is going to check, you can do level me up on Node School. It's all about level DB, it's pretty much what I showed here. Um, but in level DB, or in Node School format, which is great and fun and stuff. So that's all I have. If there's any more questions, I can answer them. Yeah. At what point, um, like you were talking about relational databases earlier, at what point, you know, what are the criteria where you get to a point where you say, okay, now this, you know, I should go to Postgres or MySQL or something like that? Um, I don't really know, actually. Uh, I guess if you have people who are used to dealing with relational stuff. I guess if you have really relational data, um, but it's and so there's like not as many resources about this particular way of doing things. I think it's really fun and it's really easy and it's really modular. But unfortunately, this is just a small corner of programming. So the, the bigger part of programming is all done with like big databases, usually usually SQL databases. Um, So one, I mean, LevelDB is really fast because it's been highly optimized by people who know what they're doing. Um, the team that wrote LevelDB was actually the same team that wrote Bigtable at Google, and then they just made a database for browsers that's like, that's not important, right? But they did it really correctly, so it's super fast. Um, yeah. 
So if you have to do kind of dynamic queries, that would be something that rel relational databases have a better answer for, I think. You can still do it with this approach, you just have to have a little more expertise to do it effectively. I think the main trade-off is like if you want to make something that you can install npm and not have to tell people to like configure, level db is really good. If you want to have to, if you want to be able to do like dynamic queries and that kind of thing on the fly, then a rela relational database is better for that because it has a little engine that can automatically uh, generate indexes and that kind of thing. But if you like this low level stuff, this is also really fun. I like doing it this way. I don't know. If you want to have fun, do it this way. If you want to have a DBA job where you optimize queries all day, you can do it the other way. <laughs> uh, yeah, question. Uh, Sure, why don't I just write some code? So, oh, I should save this because you guys would probably want that. Uh, yeah, we will. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so if we have a sub level, um, there's also a module called sub level, but I like sub level down a little better because it, it doesn't modify things as much. So if you require sub level down, um, we make a level be like normal. Actually, what as? that name yet? Okay. Um, so, it basically just does all of the nesting for you. So, if I want to, like, I can just print out the robots, uh, sublevel db robots, and cats, sublevel db cats. Anything that I do to robots cannot escape that little sandbox. So, it's not going to interfere with any of the keys in cats. So if you do have different pieces of code that might need to use the same keys, um, if you sublevel, then those pieces of code don't have to care about accidentally using the same keys. If that helps. Is this something that like you would use, you know, if you have user posts, like you can have a sublevel for one user and a sublevel for another? Yeah, you could you could use sublevels for that. Um, it's actually implemented internally with exclamation marks, so it's like it's almost exactly the same as doing it by hand. Um, it's just a little bit nicer in some ways. It's also super new, it's only like a few weeks old. So <laughs> The other one though, uh, level sub level is like two years old, so. Um, but I like this one better, because whatever. Okay, yeah, any other questions? Can you talk a bit about performance, the way you did uh, that before you did two accesses, if I understood it properly? Uh, yeah. Two queries. Oh, uh, two queries, yeah. That's to fine. Get so yeah. level, yeah, but level DB has this really ridiculous querying engine because it's built on, it's not a B tree, but it's like a B tree. It's like a log structured B tree. It's, it has all of these wacky optimizations so that sorted keys are always really fast. You mostly don't have to worry about uh, too much because it's going to do a lot of implicit caching. Um, what you should worry about is how your keys are actually going to fit in into structure, that's the hard part, and then if you do that properly, then this is going to be all really fast. So, uh, level DB is being used for the DAT project, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, datdata.com, it's used for scientific data. They're actually going to use a countdown, I think, which is one of those modules I'm showing you. Um, and it's for scientific data, which can be, you know, tens, hundreds, of gigabytes, maybe terabytes. Um, in sort of like column format. So it's, I, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but if you have a good server, you can get like um, like 90 megabytes per second dumping into level DB. Um, and reading out is, yeah, somewhere around that too. But, okay. Yeah, question. What's a relational database? A relational database, it, well, you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Okay. Maybe. You basically create tables, you create a schema that sort of specifies tables, and then you create queries that are like the relationships between those tables using <laughs> a language called SQL. 